Hello, my name is Kevin Danikowski, and this episode is on remembering, the thing that we all want to do for the MCAT. So what is remembering? How do we remember? Well, to begin, we need to understand that there is a difference between recognition and recall. Recognition is retrieving memories which do not require deep processing, where recall involves deep processing and mental effort to retrieve the memory from long-term storage. You can recognize something as familiar, but you would need to recall a phone number. Recall is split into free recall, serial recall, and queued recall. Free recall is just as you would expect, freely trying to remember some bits of information. You tend to have a preference to remember the first bits of info because they are more easily entering long-term memory. What's this effect? The primacy effect. Exactly. We just discussed it in the episode earlier. Super important for first impressions. You also remember things at the end, called the recency effect. However, we tend to ignore or forget most things in between. So drug commercials would benefit from putting side effects in the middle, but they haven't appeared to catch on to this revolution just yet. Now imagine trying to remember words in a list. For instance, remember this, fish, bear, hammock, lounge. Did you remember them in order? The question asks you to use serial recall. If I said bear, you might also recall fish or hammock which were adjacent words, but not lounge, which wasn't adjacent to bear. This is because it's easier to remember adjacent words together, called the contiguity effect. Lastly, cued recall involves using a cue or stimulus to recall something. Not very surprising. This can be done via priming, which involves providing a stimulus that will influence your thoughts and recall like walking into your ex-boss on the street and suddenly remembering you never sent her those documents you promised you would on your last day. Now that's priming, which is distinct from another term you might be remembering, framing. Framing instead is placing certain buzzwords in a question like hit versus smash when asking someone to remember a car accident. The frame will influence how you respond to something presented to you. It's obvious that framing can cause you to recall information incorrectly. So let's relate this to an experiment which created the misinformation effect. One of the experiments showed participant slides of a car stopping in front of a stop sign, after which they were given a written account of what they saw, but one group had a yield sign in the description. Upon reporting to the researchers what they had seen, participants in the misinformation group recalled seeing a yield sign even though it was actually a stop sign. Thus, the misinformation effect. So recall requires long-term memory, but once into long-term memory, how is the information stored? Well, according to semantic network theory, memories are saved via connecting meaning and stimuli, just like a semantic network. Debate rages on whether this connection between meaning and stimuli involves one or multiple systems, because studies have supported both notions. Storing must then depend on a certain filing system, to be in place for the ease of access. Thus, it must follow the retrieval structure principle, which states information is encoded to have the greatest ease of access. So as the name implies, the storage structure is dependent on how to retrieve the memory. Thus, retrieval structure principle. That was long-term memory. Now what about short-term memory? Well, short-term memory also has some unique characteristics. First, Miller's Law, which is highly criticized, states that short-term memory can hold seven plus or minus two items from experiments basically asking people to remember a list and then recall it immediately after. There were a wide variety of stimuli to account for the short-term memory, though. Short-term memory stimuli could be visual, acoustic, semantic, etc., each of which have their own encoding. So, for instance, you have visual encoding, acoustic encoding, semantic encoding. All of them are straightforward, though, and easy to remember. A variety of encoding strategies exist to remember this information. Most of these are considered elaborative encoding, which involves elaboration on the information, making connections visually, spatially, semantically, etc. It's in the name. To encode the information, you need to elaborate on the information. According to the dual coding hypothesis, in order to represent information, both visual and verbal aspects must be encoded. You find this in most memory strategies, the dual coding of visual and verbal information. First strategy, then, is chunking, 
which involves combining information to make encoding it easier. For example, when trying to remember a guy or girl's phone number, such as 312-588-3108, you can chunk the information together into larger numbers, say 312, 588, 3108. I wouldn't call that, though, because if you're wondering, it's the rejection hotline for Chicago. When you've received it enough times, you just kind of commit it to memory. Chunking can also involve an acrostic device, which is just using the first letter of a word for connecting other words as a way of chunking information. Two examples are in this mnemonic I created, you are running out of gas, standing for general adaption syndrome and gas, and the phases are alarm phase, resistance phase, and exhaustion phase in the word are. But that's for another episode. Acrostic devices are similar to the PEG system, which uses numbers or alphabets chronologically to remember the information via rhyme, shape, starting letter, etc. For example, lists at the store, A is for apples, B is for blueberries, C is for carrots, D is for double-decker Oreos. Each letter is a PEG to hang information on. This list can also be memorized using the method of loci, or memory palace. For this, I want you to picture being in your house. In the first room, you see an enormous apple tree jutting through the ceiling with apples rolling towards your feet over a pile of crunching leaves. Then close the door, go to the next room. And in the next room, you find smashed blueberries oozing outside of the door with the cookie monster sitting there in the middle, staring at you while stuffing his face full of blueberries and yelling, these are my blueberries. In the next room, you see a bunch of girls, or guys, wearing bunny ears while eating carrots. And you get the idea. This method is used by memory athletes to memorize over 4,000 binary digits in order in a matter of, not hours, 30 minutes. Or 28 shuffled card decks in order within an hour. Crazy. The link system, however, is what most people use. The link system uses vivid visual associations to all items in the list, like a picture, thus linking them visually. One may also use robust methods such as maintenance rehearsal, which is just representing said item again and again, thus rehearsing it maintains the memory. Other strategies exist, though these here appear to be the highest yield. And that's it for this episode.